This video will explore one of the ladies of noir, actress Virginia Mayo. Born in St. Louis, Missouri, Virginia was born Virginia Jones. She was the daughter of newspaper reporter Luke and his wife, Martha Henrietta Nay Rautenstrauch Jones. Her family had roots back to the earliest days of St. Louis, including great, great, great grandfather, Captain James Piggott, who founded East St. Louis, Illinois in 1797. Captain James Piggott was born in 1735 in Pennsylvania or Maryland and died in 1799. He was a veteran of the American Revolution, having fought with Pennsylvania militia under the leadership of General Mad Anthony Wayne in New Jersey and later with George Rogers Clark and in the defense of Fort Jefferson on the Western Front. He established a fort south of Cahokia on the Illinois side of the Mississippi and later won a license to operate a ferry from what is now East St. Louis across the Mississippi to St. Louis, the first such ferry with a direct service from St. Louis to the East Bank. Some credit him with founding the city of East St. Louis, where there is a street named after him. He is a central figure in the book Captains of the Wilderness by Carl R. Bar Baldwin, which follows his career from his early adulthood near Hannistown in western Pennsylvania to his last years as a ferryboat entrepreneur, landowner, and judge in St. Clair County, Illinois. He married twice. By his first wife, Eleanor, he had three sons, William, Levi, and Jonas, and it is through them that Virginia Mayo was descended. After Eleanor's death in 1780, he lived as a widower for several years. Then he accepted a young woman with children who had been abandoned by her husband. Francis James Ballou lived with James Piggott out of wedlock, bearing four more children in addition to his existing three, and her four by her vanished husband. Around 1790, they finally wed, and their daughter, Asnath, was born shortly afterward, then the last child, Isaac Newton Piggott. Later generations numbered descendants in the thousands all over the United States. The suspected burial place of Piggott is thought to lie in an unmarked grave next to the Holy Family Parish Log Church in Cahokia, which is shown here. It's a shame that with all of the different offices springing up in our public universities in the United States, for example, equity and inclusion offices, that there doesn't seem to be any interest in discovering where our Revolutionary War veterans are buried. We could discern certain information about Piggott uh, if we were able to find his grave, but unfortunately it seems no one has had any interest in doing so. Young Virginia's aunt operated an, an acting school in the St. Louis area, which Virginia began attending at age six. She also had a series of dancing instructors engaged by her aunt, who was very eager to see her education. Following her graduation from Solden High School in 1937, Virginia landed her, per her first professional acting and dancing jobs at the St. Louis Municipal Opera Theater, which is an open-air theater, more commonly known as the Muni, and in an act with six other girls at the Hotel Jefferson in St. Louis. Performer Andy Mayo, impressed with her ability, recruited her to appear in his act, Morton and Mayo. Morton and Mayo were a vaudeville dance and comedy duo from the 1920s to the 1940s. They were predominantly known for an artificial horse act known as Pansy the Horse. Mayo was Andy Mayo and Morton was portrayed by Al Morton from 1923 to 1931 and Nani Morton from 1931 to 1942. Al Morton and Andy Mayo toured the United States on a variety of vaudeville stages, including the Orpheum Circuit and the Muni. These shows would typically include a feature film presentation and several other live vaudeville acts, including dancing girls and a band, so they were frequently recruiting dancing girls. In 1925, they were featured in Chicago's Frolics Cafe's Frivolous Frolics and toured the entire United States, including Hawaii. In 1930, they began acting as a three-person act, with Al Morton in the front, Andy Mayo in the back, performing Pansy the Horse, and a third female performer, this was Virginia Mayo, acting as the horse's trainer. 
Mayo toured the American vaudeville circuit for three years, serving as ringmaster and comedic foil for Pansy the Horse. They appeared together in some short films and were a huge hit at Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe Nightclub in the Broadway Theater District, where she was spotted by Samuel Goldwyn. I covered Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe Nightclub in my video on May Murray, so be sure to check that out. In 1941, now officially known by her stage name Virginia Mayo, she got another career break as she appeared on Broadway with Eddie Cantor in Banjo Eyes. Although Cantor was known as Banjo Eyes, the title referred not to his character, but to a talking racehorse, Pansy the Horse, appearing again by Morton and Mayo. In dream sequences, Banjo Eyes would give Cantor's character tips on which horses were going to win different races, but warned him this talent for picking the winners would vanish if he ever placed a bet himself. The World War II anthem, We Did It Before and We Can Do It Again, was interpolated into the score for no apparent reason other than to stir up patriotism among audience members in, this, in these early years of World War II. Cantor closed the show by singing a medley, medley of his hits in his customary blackface. The work into Eddie Cantor's use of blackface hasn't really been explored, to my surprise. Um, but he used it a lot. He used it for decades. The show closed when Cantor suffered a medical emergency in 1941. In the early 1940s, Virginia Mayo's talent and striking beauty came to the attention of movie mogul Samuel Goldwyn, who signed her to an acting contract with his company. Goldwyn only made a few films a year and usually loaned out the actors he had under contract to other producers. Her first notable role was in Jack London in 1943, which starred her future husband, Michael O'Shea, for producer Samuel Bronston. Goldwyn originally planned a feature with Danny Kaye in the film Up in Arms, but he felt she needed more experience and gave the role to Constance Dowling. Mayo was placed in the chorus just so she could learn, but she was never officially a member of the Goldwyn Girls. Mayo already knew how to tap dance and sing. Her performance in Painting the Clouds with Sunshine from 1951 is delightful and really showcases her dancing ability. RKO borrowed her for a support role in a musical, Seven Days Ashore, in 1944. Mayo's first starring role came in 1944 opposite comedian Bob Hope in The Princess and the Pirate. It earned over $13 million. Goldwyn then made her Danny Kaye's leading lady for the musicals Wonder Man and The Kid from Brooklyn, both very popular. Going against the previous stereotype, Mayo accepted the supporting role of unsympathetic gold digger Marie Derry in William Wyler's drama The Best Years of Our Lives for Goldwyn. Her performance drew favorable reviews from critics, as the film also became the highest grossing film in the United States since Gone with the Wind. At the zenith of her career, Mayo was seen as the quintessential voluptuous Hollywood beauty. It was said that she looked like a pinup painting come to life. According to widely published reports from the late 1940s, the Sultan of Morocco declared her beauty to be tangible proof of the existence of God. This may have been just positive press made up by the Goldwyn team. Eagle Lion Films borrowed her to play the lead in Out of the, in Out of the Blue from 1947, a comedy with George Brent. Mayo was reunited with Kay in The Secret Life of Walter Mitty in 1947, another big success, and it was remade with Ben Stiller in 2013. There was also A Song is Born in 1948, a box office disappointment. Mayo never stopped working. In between these films, Warners borrowed her for the lead in a film noir, Smart Girls Don't Talk. Mayo was a smart operator and would request certain roles from Goldwyn directly after reviewing scripts. In an interview years later, she recalled really wanting to work with skilled director Willie Wilder. Mayo received excellent reviews in another unsympathetic role, playing James Cagney's sultry and scheming wife in the gangster classic White Heat. Mayo admitted she was frightened by Cagney as the psychotic gunman in White Heat because he was so realistic. She was top billed in The Silver Chalice in 1954, opposite Paul Newman in his film debut. The film was a notorious flop. Despite being nominated for a Golden Globe Award for his performance, Newman later called it the worst motion picture produced during the 1950s. 
When the film was broadcast on television in 1966, he took out an advertisement in a Hollywood trade paper apologizing for his performance and requesting people not to watch the film. This backfired, and the broadcast received unusually high ratings. The film is sometimes referred to as Paul Newman and the Holy Grail. Newman called the film the worst motion picture produced during the 1950s and once screened it for guests at his home handing out pots, wooden spoons, and whistles, and encouraging the audience to offer noisy critiques. It's not known why Newman hated the film so much. The Silver Chalice had biblical themes like many films of the time, it had a science fiction-like setting, and was very over the top. The Academy Award Committee thought highly of it, its soundtrack was also nominated for an Academy Award. It may be that Paul Newman didn't see the themes the same way because he was not Christian and it was a Christian film but it's it's just not it's just not known why he hated it so much she uh, post Warner's Benedict Borgo gave her the lead in Pearl of the South Pacific in 1955 and then she was cast in Great Day in the Morning in 1956 she went to 20th Century Fox to play Robert Ryan's leading lady in The Proud Ones, and then she did Congo Crossing at Universal. She did The Big Land in 1957 back at Warner's, and then played Cleopatra in the 1957 fantasy film The Story of Mankind, again another biblically minded film. She made The Tall Stranger for Allied Artists. Fort Dobbs in 1958 at Warner's and Westbound in 1959 at Warner's. Her last film of the decade was 1959's Jet Over the Atlantic. She began guest starring on television shows such as Wagon Train, The Loretta Young Show, and Lux Playhouse. Mayo and her husband made a pilot for a TV series, McGarry and His Mouse, in 1960, which was not picked up. She then flew to Italy to make Revolt of the Mercenaries in 1961, an Italian-Spanish historical adventure film. Mayo wed Michael O'Shea in 1947, and they remained married until he died in 1973, which was uncommon then in Hollywood and is uncommon now. The couple had one child, Mary Catherine O'Shea, born in 1953. For several decades, the family lived in Thousand Oaks, California, and then moved to Texas. In later years, Mayo developed a passion for painting and occupied her time doting on her three grandsons. She converted to Roman Catholicism inspired by Archbishop Fulton Sheen and her husband who was Catholic. If you haven't seen Archbishop Sheen's oration skills, I suggest you watch them. He had a remarkable ability to come up with turns of phrase and really memorable sayings. Archbishop Sheen had television shows and radio shows in the United States throughout the 1950s, and so he was well known to many Americans. Now uh, we will dive into the marriage of Virginia Mayo and Michael O'Shea. O'Shea was born in Hartford, Connecticut, of Irish descent and Catholic. He wanted to follow his five brothers into the police force, but was not tall enough. His family was responsible for shoeing horses, including horses of the NYPD. He dropped out of school at 12 and began his acting career in vaudeville by touring with boxing idol Jack Johnson's show. He did a variety of jobs, including soda jerk, bricklayer, private detective, and bodyguard. O'Shea played drums and the banjo and could sing in his tenor voice. Much like his character from Lady of Burlesque, Biff Brannigan, O'Shea was a comedian and MC at speakeasies. His written comments on photographs of himself and other actresses are often funny. If things had gone his way, O'Shea wouldn't have been an actor. I always wanted to be a policeman, but I was too short, explained the 5'9 Shea in a 1966 interview. For three years in a row, after I turned 20, I tried to join the force, he recalled, but the answer was always the same. Try the fire department. It's only natural for him to feel this calling. It was in his blood. His five older brothers had all entered NYPD law enforcement. A husky boy, O'Shea soon became head of a neighborhood gang. He had his first crack at show business as a singer at the Amateurs and won several contests, a feat he credits to the fact that his gang rooted for him. 
In his Prohibition years, O'Shea worked as a comic and MC in speakeasies, like I said, and started his own dance band, Michael O'Shea and his Stationary Gypsies. Billing himself as Eddie O'Shea, he also acted with stock companies and in radio until the point he was noticed by the film industry for his 1942 Broadway appearance as a World War II soldier in the Eve of St. Mark. The play was a hit and film producers began approaching O'Shea to do screen tests. Samuel Bronston offered him the title role in the biopic Jack London in 1943. The cast included Virginia Mayo, who would become his second wife. He returned to Broadway with a role in the revival of The Red Mill, which ran for 531 performances. After his career in film waned, he was largely out of films by 1952. He took many roles in television. He never expressed any insecurity or discomfort at the fact that his wife was so much more successful than him in Hollywood. He also preferred the stage. There are comments of his on photographs with his fellow actresses in the films, such as Barbara Stanwyck, Ain't She Sweet? I'm Pretty Too. So he had a very rambunctious sense of humor. According to an interview given in 1972, O'Shea finally fulfilled his policeman wishes after a fashion by working as a plain clothes operative for the FBI in the mid-1960s by helping to break up a gambling ring plaguing O'Shea's home turf of Ventura County, California. Sheriff William Hill at the Ventura County Courthouse regards was highly regarded by O'Shea, and O'Shea called him a top-notch lawman in the weekly magazine of Ventura County 1966 issue. O'Shea had a lot of love for his second wife, and he did have some drama from his first wife. His first wife was Grace Watts, by whom he had two children. That marriage ended in divorce in 1947, the same year he married Virginia. I don't know if there was any overlap. In the year his one child with Virginia was born, Mary Catherine O'Shea, in 1953, O'Shea's first wife sued him for unpaid alimony, so it seems she or her attorneys were keeping an eye on her ex-husband. In 1957, O'Shea pled guilty to discharging a firearm. In August of 1959, O'Shea was arrested after brandishing a pistol in defense of his wife in a Philadelphia restaurant. An argument between her and another customer over air conditioning was supposedly the cause. O'Shea was discovered dead in his bathtub in Dallas, Texas in December 1973, and Virginia said the mob had killed him. As I said, O'Shea reported illegal gambling in Ventura County in his later years. Often, gamblers would use boats off the California coast to escape authorities, and O'Shea had noticed illegal gambling dens in his own community, which disturbed him. You can learn more about the gambling of California in my Black Dahlia video. O'Shea also had prohibition connections, which may have gotten him in trouble with the mob in his early years. His connection to boxer Jack Johnson, who ran an illegal speakeasy in the Harlem Cotton Club from 1923 to 1940, would have made him some enemies, especially since his family had NYPD police officers. In 1920, heavyweight boxing champion Jack Johnson rented the upper floor of the building on the corner of 142nd Street and Lenox Avenue in the heart of Harlem and opened an intimate supper club called the Club Deluxe. British-born Oni Madden, a prominent bootlegger and gangster since the age of 11, nicknamed The Killer, took over the club after his release from Sing Sing Prison in 1923 and changed its name to The Cotton Club. Oni was a boxing promoter. The two arranged a deal that allowed Johnson to remain the club's manager. The Cotton Club was used as an outlet to sell beer to the Prohibition crowd. So it could have been that O'Shea made some enemies in his early years and this came back later to impact him. The statement by Virginia that the mob had killed him was never explained by her. Um, it's not something she refers to in her later interviews, so it might have been misreported or maybe it never happened at all, but it certainly is a very interesting ending to the film noir actress Virginia Mayo and her husband Michael O'Shea.